Hey everyone, welcome to a video on getting started in NeoFPS, along with an overview of the NeoFPS hub. I'll have some timestamps in the description so you can find the relevant bits for you, but otherwise let's just get started at step one, importing. Okay, so to start off with, I have a new project open here in Unity 2019.4. It's completely blank and unchanged, and I have the Unity package manager open on the NeoFPS entry from my assets. The installation process should be similar for every version of Unity from this point, going up to at least Unity 2022. It could change in the future as Unity mess around with the package manager or with their workflows, who knows. The main difference, though, between Unity versions up to this point is just going to be how you find my assets. Now for this video, I'm going to assume that you know how to install an asset itself, since that is a pretty fundamental Unity skill. And to be honest, Unity themselves are probably the best ones to uh, cover things like that. Now, before we get the asset imported, there is actually one thing that I'm going to do. This isn't necessary in the slightest, but it's just a little trick to speed up the import process. So, as I said at the beginning, this is a fresh, untouched Unity project. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to Build Settings, Player Settings, and then down here under the Other Settings dropdown, I'm going to switch the colour space to Linear. Gamma color space used to be the standard, but nowadays it's been replaced with linear for most devices and workflows, since linear gives much more accurate rendering and lighting results. NeoFPS will actually switch to linear color space automatically when you apply the Unity settings, but the reason I'm going to do it now is because every time you change this setting, Unity has to reprocess all textures, light maps, and so on. So here we are, we've got the package manager up with NeoFPS. I've got it downloaded and updated, and I'm just going to hit import, and then we'll skip ahead to the next step. Okay, so after a minute, we have the asset package contents list. This is all of the textures, scripts, audio files, and so on. And we're just going to leave it with everything selected, and then hit import. Right, so a couple of console messages pop up, and then another much quicker import as it grabs the post-processing package dependency. The first message is just NeoFPS noting that it's creating a new settings file to track its updates and project settings. And then the second message is notifying that it's checking for package dependencies, which is how the post-processing is pulled in. And as soon as that's done, we'll be presented with the NeoFPS hub. So when NeoFPS is first imported, the hub will open up on this Unity settings page. This is all your Unity project settings, such as physics, layers, and tags, collision matrix, input axes, and so on. Now, NeoFPS requires a number of these to be set up quite specifically for things like input rebinding or scene interaction to work properly. So it provides this set of tools here for doing that. Up top, this easy mode lets you simply apply all the required settings on the spot. If you didn't follow that step changing gamma to linear at the start, uh, this will trigger a big rebuild. If you did, then it should be pretty transparent and quick. If you're bringing NeoFPS into a project that already has custom settings, then you can use the individual settings below to break it down. Apply automatically, we'll just apply those relevant settings there and then. You can also hit apply manually, which will open up the relevant Unity settings window so you can tweak them as you need. Lastly, you can hit the learn more button to be taken to the relevant page in the NeoFPS docs to see what's required of it. Apply automatically, you can do individually for all of these different categories and just manually set the one that's relevant. Or you can do the entire lot together and that's what we're gonna do here. And that was nice and painless. Now, if we were to look at the physics, for example, we've got a fully fleshed out set of layers with the collision matrix all set up and optimized for it. Just as a note, if I change any of the settings in a future NeoFPS update, then when you import that update, the hub will pop up again on this page with a warning saying which settings need changing. Anyhow, with the project settings out of the way, we can look at the rest of the hub. Normally, when you open up the hub, it will start on this front page here. Down at the bottom, you can see the current version of NeoFPS that we're actually running right now. And then we have a few sections with various links to things like the documentation. There's a link to the Discord here, so you can come and get support or join in with the NEO community. Alongside that is the forum post, website, and support email. 
Generally, the best way to get support is through the Discord, but if you're not that way inclined, then feel free to email from here. But yeah. There is also a checkbox down at the bottom here to say, do you want to show the hub on startup? On, and the hub will appear each time you open the project. Off, and you'll need to open it yourself from the Unity menu via Tools, Neo FPS, Neo FPS Hub, and that will show it as you see here. Okay, so Unity settings you've already seen. Next, we have upgrade notes. This goes through each of the different versions and tells you what's changed between each one, and it allows you to highlight specific assets and items that have been added or changed, for example. And it lists any changes that you yourself will need to make to your project. Next up, we have the quick start section. So this has a number of simple guides to things like scene setup, uh, important items in the scene. Again, this lets you highlight the different prefabs, for example, or skip to different quick starts for a specific topic. We have quick starts for the Neo FPS folder structure. There's also quick starts for characters, so character spawns and health and shields. And for firearms, so we have muzzle effects and overheating. More of these quick starts will be added as time goes on, but these should just give you a quick jumping off point for common tasks or features. Okay, after the quick starts, we have a section for the demo scenes. This lists the demos that are included with the FPS. We can select it in the hierarchy, which pings the scene file and shows the folder that it's in. Or we can open up the scene directly here from the hub. If you load one of the demo scenes, then it will pop over to this scene info subpage. So any demo scene within Neo FPS will have one of these README objects here, like this one. The README's just guide you through the contents of the scene. So for example, they might show you the prefabs that have been dropped in or which spawn the folder with the different weapon prefabs here, for example, and you have different objects in the scene that you can highlight so you can see how they're set up. Inside the hub here, this is exactly the same readme. Uh, it detects the scene change. So if we were to switch scenes to parkour, for example, then here we are, here's the readme. And yeah, this is now looking at the contents of the parkour scene. Okay, game settings. So there's a really important distinction to make here, if we look at these. Uh, these game settings are not the Unity project settings. These are the settings your end user, your player, has access to from inside the game. So whenever you hit run, it checks for these .settings files within the game directory. And if it doesn't find them, then it creates a new one using the default settings that you set here. And these are settings like resolution, mouse sensitivity, gamepad profile, music volume, things like that. Again, what you're changing here are the defaults. If you were to hit play in the editor, change these settings in the hub, and then hit play again, you're not going to see any difference. And that's because those settings have already been generated. So if you have already hit play, and you want to tweak a default setting, then you can click this delete user settings file button. And that will remove the dot settings file. From that point on, hitting play will show your changes that next time. As a side note, if you distribute your game, then you don't want to include the settings files that were generated when you tested the build. Deleting these will make sure that your player gets the defaults and isn't set up with any of your custom resolutions or input sensitivities and things like that. Right, so that was the game settings. Below that, we have the managers. So these are the settings that you, the developer, use to affect the game experience and setup. For example, we have the audio manager here. This points at the mixer for all the different audio channels, and then the individual output groups and volume paths here. Below that are the pooled audio source prefabs. Uh, these are used for things like impact audio. We have input settings. So this has keyboard layout. If you happen to be aiming at a different localization for your core market, then you can set the default layout here that you've based your key mappings around. So for example, we have QWERTY, AZERTY, and so on. This can be changed in game. So if we hit play here, and we look at the settings, input bindings, 
and then expand this reset to default section. Here we can remap the keys so that the uh, physical locations, um, i.e. your finger placement, stays the same across different keyboard layouts. Aside from that, we have the input axes that are available to your input handler scripts. Generally, you're not going to want to change those. Uh, same goes for the input buttons. These are the actions that appear in the rebinding list, along with their display name, default keys, and so on. If you do add any new buttons, then it's best to add them to the very end of the list, and then you would hit this uh, generate FPS input button constants here to generate the updated script, and the new buttons will appear in here, and then you'll be able to access them from your code. The new FPS input system is based on the old Unity input manager. There is an extension package included that uses the newer Unity input system, and in a future update a little while away from now, I'll be switching that over to the default because it makes extending and swapping actions, as well as supporting lots of different controllers and platforms, much, much easier. So below the buttons, we have the gamepad profiles. This maps those actions above to the different physical buttons on a gamepad. And then in game here, wherever it's gone, we have input settings. In here, if you have a supported gamepad connected, you'll be able to enable or disable it here and switch between the different profiles like default, left-handed, and so on. And then lastly, we have the input contexts. So these are used to specify exactly which controls are available at any one time. So each input handler script has a specific context and only the input handlers for the active context will be processed each frame. This means that you won't be running around and shooting by accident while you're clicking around in the menu, for example. So below the input manager, we have the inventory database. This defines the unique IDs for all of the inventory items that you can use. It's divided into tables, uh, which are essentially scriptable object assets that you can create for your project that can then contain different weapon IDs, armor, tools, ammunition, all kinds of things like that. And then you would add your table asset that you've created by dragging and dropping it in here and it will be accessible to your inventory items. It is best to create your own table just to make sure that any changes that I make to Neo's demos don't end up overwriting your inventory IDs when you update. Below the inventory, we have the pooling manager. So this is the default prefab pools available in each scene. So for example, here we have bullet casings and then the shell ejector modules on the firearms will use the pooling system instead of instantiating prefabs directly. I should point out that any objects that are listed in here will always be loaded into memory. There is also a scene-based version of this for any pooled prefabs that you want to have a more limited scope. And then when you enter that scene, it essentially merges these two pools so that they're accessed as one from your scripts. Okay, next up we have the save game manager. So this is where exactly your save game files are going to be stored. So here, for example, we have them in the project subfolder of app data. We have a save file inspector and then various settings for how exactly the save system should work. How thumbnails and screenshots are taken when you save, for example, and any objects that are registered with the save system so that they can be instantiated at runtime, but still save and load correctly. Again, anything in here will be permanently loaded but there is also a scene-based version of this one to keep your project cleaner and more optimal. Scene manager, this one is dead simple. This is used for loading different levels in game. The loading scene here should be pointed at a small scene that will be loaded in and displayed whilst the current gameplay scene is unloaded. And then the new gameplay scene will be loaded asynchronously in the background. While that's going on, the loading scene here can do its thing like showing gameplay hints, or animated loading icons, things like that. Once the gameplay scene is available, the loading scene will be removed again and the gameplay scene will be made active. The surface manager is used to specify the different visual and audio effects for different surface types in the game. For the visuals, we have impact effects and below that we can specify the layers that the decals are shown for. As standard, I have decals disabled for the default layer because I can't guarantee that you won't be using animated objects without rigid bodies. 
And in that situation, what you might end up with is decals floating in midair as the objects that they're supposed to stick to move around. If you're comfortable you're not going to be doing that, then you might want to switch this on for the default layer for your projects. So that's the visual effects. We also have the different audio effects for impacts here as well. And then after the managers, we have the wizards section of the hub. So these wizards allow you to create fully set up prefabs from your geometry using step-by-step -step questions and answers and then setting properties. And then you can generate those prefabs and use them in game. Uh, you can use the wizards to quickly create prefabs for each of these different categories. So we have player character, modular firearm. Um, I do have a video running all the way through the process of using this one up on YouTube already. Uh, we have melee weapons, thrown weapons, pickups, and each of these wizards comes with templates that you can use as a starting point. So for pickups, we have ammo crates, armor, firearms, shield boosters, all that kind of stuff. We have the interactive objects wizard. This one doesn't have any templates since it's such a broad topic, but essentially it means any objects that can be interacted with by walking up to it and hitting use. And then lastly, we have the custom scripts wizard. So this one lets you pick a script type. So motion graph elements, firearm modules, save game formatters, input handlers, all these different types of things. You specify a class name and a namespace, pick an export location, and then it will spit out these template scripts with the correct name, the same uh, namespace that you set, and with some placeholder methods and properties that you can expand on. Okay, so that was the wizards. Next up, we just have a brief page outlining some of the integrations that we have available. You can use the links here to take you to the GitHub for the specific integration. So you can grab it straight from there. And then you can go to the asset store to actually grab the asset itself. So what's listed here is the integrations that are available at this moment. There are also some more on the GitHub that are partial integrations or say, for example, very simple single script integrations, things like that. So it is also worth having a look on the GitHub itself just to see what's available. Uh, for example, Playmaker here, this one's partially integrated. There's some very useful near FPS features that have been exposed to it, but I've got a bunch more planned before I call it complete and add it to the hub listing that we've just seen. And then the last section is a page for the standalone tools. We have the motion graph editor. This is where you create your locomotion state machines for your player character. We have the motion debugger, which you can connect to the character at runtime, record their movement along with all the input and output data each frame. And then uh, you can scrub through your recordings when something goes a bit weird and it'll help you track down what could have caused it. We also have the Neo save file inspector. So this lets you open and explore the binary save files and see what data is being saved within them. That again can help track down any weirdness if things aren't saving and reloading as you'd expect them to. Each of these tools is also available in the Unity menus under Tools Neo FPS, and there are buttons to open them in the related inspectors and the like. You can also use the links here in the hub to check out the documentation for each of these tools. So for example, the Motion Graph Editor page here. This one walks you through the layout and all the different elements and how to use it. So yeah, that's the Neo FPS hub. The only thing in there that you really have to be aware of is the Unity settings section. But overall, it's intended to be a central place for you to access the tools and features of your Neo FPS project and to act as a bit of a jumping off point as well to help you get going. So yeah, demo scenes here. It's a good idea to have a look at each of these. Uh, you can load them up from here, get some info about the scene, hit play, have a rummage around, give them a look-see and see how they all work. I hope that was helpful. If you have any questions or feedback, then head on over to the Discord and say hi. Uh, verified users can get support there, and there's places to show off your projects or to get tips and feedback. But yeah, otherwise, I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.